everyone. I'm Aubrey Ruby, and I'm a senior fellow at the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council. And I'm so pleased to be joined today by Admaso Tedese, the CEO of TDB Group out of Nairobi. Welcome, Admaso. Thank you, Aubrey. Good to be here. Tell us, what is TDB Group? What do you do? Well, TDB, uh, as the name suggests, is a uh, trade-focused financial institutions are quite specialized. We, we do trade and development finance, uh, which is more common in the, in the specific industry that we're in. But we are a little bit unique in the sense that we, we combine multiple product lines in one, in one FI that is uh, usually very convenient to our clients, which, which practically means we can do anything from 90 days to 20 years, right? So usually, Development finance institutions do long-term lending, right? That's typically where you have market failure, uh, infrastructure, classic power in general. But we can do a uh, very fast-moving, dynamic trade finance business, which, which is uh, the typical domain of a commercial bank, right? But, but that is what makes us very interesting. We can give a client short, medium, and long-term facilities together with guarantees, and we can even do quasi equity and, and so on. So we, we, we are much, we're much more flexible and um, wider spectrum type of, of financial institution than typically is the case in the industry. And, and can you give us an example of the type of financing you do for clients? Is there one that comes to memory right away? Well, yeah, there's quite a few. I mean, we are celebrating our 35th anniversary this year. So we are a fairly well-established and mature financial institution. Uh, when I talk about the examples, you'll see that we cut across a wide sector. We do, as I mentioned, infrastructure, but also agriculture and industry. We do services and, and, and of course, commodities as well and mining. So we're, we're very diversified in terms of sectors that we cover, uh, in addition to the products. And, and by way of example, you know, we've done small deals. We've done large deals. We've, we've done, of course, the spectrum in terms of tenor. An example, for instance, you know, recently we did a $10 million pre-export finance uh, deal with a group of uh, Madagascar-based uh, vanilla growers and, and exporters. And this is a, uh, you know, a, a very high impact type of trade finance transaction that supports a country like Madagascar that is majority agricultural in nature. So that's one example, you know, pre-export finance facility of 10 million. And then on the flip side, you know, you'll see us doing a uh, hundred million dollars for 15 years uh, with a floating liquefied natural gas project in Mozambique, the, the famous one that uh, we won an award for last year together with uh, Credit Agricole. But it's the same, uh, the same kind of transaction that uh, US Exim Bank was talking about recently. It of course involves Mobile Exxon together with uh, ENI of Italy. And of course, you have the Baker Hughes of this world and General Electric as downstream contractors benefiting in a, in a, in a mega multi-billion dollar project. So we were one of the first to come to that one. So that would be on the larger end. But we've also done uh, very uh, pioneering projects. For instance, the Turkana Wind Power Project. Of course. The largest wind farm. Yeah, wind power project in... Uh, in East Africa, here in Kenya, 310 megawatts, uh, just under $800 million capex, mega deal. And there again, we, we participated together with some of our strategic partners like the African Development Bank and others. Uh, and of course, we didn't just put in uh, debt, we also put in quasi equity because there was a little bit of a gap uh, with risk capital. So being, being solutions oriented as we are, we were able to chip in a little bit of of risk capital too in the form of quasi equity. So that, that would be in the, in the power space. And do you have a specific geographic remit? Well, uh, that's a dynamic uh, question for us because we've been expanding uh, progressively over the years. We, we were born in Eastern Africa. So our, our natural home is Eastern and Southern Africa. So that, in, that is uh, the, the founders and the original market of ours was, was basically Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Zambia, uh, Zimbabwe, and a few others. Those were the original markets. But since then, we've, we've moved up to 22 jurisdictions 
and that covers uh, Mozambique, as I mentioned, but also Egypt and all the islands, Madagascar, Comoros, Mauritius, Seychelles, um, Malawi, of course, as also another founder. So we've, 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 we've cut across the whole eastern seaboard of the African continent from the northeast all the way down to the southeast. That includes Egypt as well these days. And so and we'll be heading out to the west coast. That was just my closing point on this question. Ghana and Senegal uh, are, are two particular countries and Angola as well that we expect to join in the coming year or so. That's fantastic. I'm sure your products are needed across, uh, across the continent. Um, so as an African DFI, as a development finance institution in Africa, based there, living there, uh, you know, does it make you different than other investors in the region? Well, it does. It does in the sense that we are an impact financier. I think that would be our headline character. But of course, uh, within, within, within the broad space of impact, we do a great deal. And, and I think uh, the, the fact that we have so many different products under one roof uh, makes us quite distinct in the marketplace because clearly clients uh, tend to, to want to have relationships that can give them solutions across a spectrum as opposed to having to go to one bank just for one product. Then you have to go to another bank for another product. And so clearly there's always... Um, synergy and, and efficiency by being able to have one-stop shop type solutions. Um, what also makes us very interesting is we're a very partnership driven organization. So we can give clients access to other partners through us. So typically uh, the relationships, for instance, we've had with American partners like US Exim Bank and US Aid, uh, even Citibank, you know, we would typically do deals and, and, and involve our American partners uh, behind us in one way or the other. In some cases, they don't want to be at the forefront. They would rather participate through us. In other cases, uh, it's about co-financing. So, you know, we do, we do offer uh, a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of uh, forging solutions for clients. And that includes bringing partners, offering multiple products. And of course, you know, generally in our industry, there is a little bit of a, of a perception that there are very long lead times involved mm -hmm. to get yes. institutions from institutions like us, unlike commercial banks or investment banks who tend to be, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, efficient and dynamic and quick to turn around. So we, we tend to, to put a lot of premium on, on turnaround time and we try very hard to, to give our clients uh, timely solutions and, we're not we're not such a uh, bureaucratic organization. We can be we can be also quite uh, quite uh, quick in turnaround time. So, as a trade finance bank, you see that becomes very important. You can't be giving a client a 90-day facility letters of credit, and it takes you one year to give the decision, right? Because that is a criticism typically in our industry. You know, they're they're very good partners to have development finance institutions, but they take typically extended periods of time to, to give decisions and to operationalize facilities. So by, the, by, the by our nature of being trade finance orientated, we, we, do, we do actually move quicker than others. And because of the range of products you have, I'm sure that means a range of partners. And so you, meant, you mentioned USXM, but you know, how do you think you could work with a US Development Finance Corporation, the new DFC? Uh, you know, are there some innovative ways that you could potentially work together in the future? And have you done other things with European DFIs that have been innovative? Uh, yes, uh, actually the answer is a big yes. We, we have done uh, a great deal with uh, a whole series of, of development finance institutions in the OECD world. Uh, of course, we have yet to, to, to commence our cooperation with the DFC, which is of course uh, newish. We all know, but um, uh, OPIC, of course, we had reached out to them earlier, but they didn't quite have the same scope or mandate that the, the, the DFC has. So we have been uh, discussing with the DFC and we are looking forward to the possibility of, 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 a, of a fruitful relationship with them. Uh, in Europe, of course, our footprint is very wide. We, we've worked for many years now with the Germans, the KFW Group, AFD, Agence France de Développement, the European Investment Bank, the CDC of the UK, 
FMO of the Netherlands, uh, the IFU of Denmark, and, um, and of course, a whole host of commercial banks as well, Societe Generale, Credit Suisse, uh, Barclays, and Standard Chartered, HSBC, and of course, in the US, uh, several commercial banks as well. So our, our footprint and our financial relationships are actually quite extensive. And, and, and we just think the, the US DFC will be uh, a very good addition uh, to that very strong set of uh, DFI partners that we do have in the OECD world. And one of the missions of the DFC is to be, you know, catalytic to, uh, you know, basically spur more investment interests out of the U.S. into African markets or other lower income regions. And, you know, what, and we've been thinking hard and you and I have talked about it in the past on, on how to get more U.S. pension funds engaged. You know, what are some innovative ideas? People talk about blended finance, but, you know, what are some ways that development finance institutions can, can mobilize even billions more. I'm glad you asked that, uh, Aubrey, because we we have really been uh, pursuing uh, innovative finance as a way of of creating growth capital for TDB, and through that, of course, enable enable the the partnerships, the the ventures to to happen across the Atlantic, but also to grow the African business space. And 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 we've always believed that institutional capital. Uh, is, is an important part of our, of our capital base. Uh, five to seven years ago, we, we could count one institutional investor in our shareholding. Today, we have uh, over 16 institutional shareholders. Of about six of them are pension funds. We have insurance companies and, and other specialized FIs who are very keen to have a proper triple bottom line relationship with us, which we do deliver very effectively. Uh, we've been paying dividends for many years to all of these institutional investors, so they feel comfortable that they're getting, you know, the triple bottom line in terms of development impact, but also getting a, a healthy financial return. So we are, we do have that commercial uh, character behind us because we're not funded by donor money. We don't have, uh, you know, taxpayer money to to offer by way of concession or grant. So we we tend to really provide proper financing and, and the value, the value addition that we provide, of course, is we give tenor and we take a little bit more risk than the others would. And of course, the turnaround time that I mentioned as well, over and above, of course, just making the financing available. Access to finance is a huge problem in our part of the world because clearly we're, we're not as capitalized as, as you know, OECD countries. So yeah, we, uh, we see pension funds in the US and uh, specialized institutional investors that would have uh, a triple bottom line kind of uh, interest as being a very suitable uh, strategic partner of, of TDB. And so there's many ways to do that. It can be direct or one it could also create an SPV that maybe the Development Finance uh, Corporation of the US can play a facilitating role to help say pension funds like the Chicago Teacher Pensions Fund or any other kind of significant pension fund that might want to have a little bit of exposure to our part of the world just to help, you know, change the, the risk, the risk metric of their portfolio having um, uncorrelated assets, as we all say. So I think, I think from an allocation perspective, we can offer U.S. institutional investors a value proposition that is, is uncommon because we are investment grade. Uh, and so we do provide that, that sort of uh, comfort that we're where we're, we're, we're sort of, um, you know, several notches above the average risk profile of our region. But at the same time, we do give uh, fairly attractive returns. Our return on equity has been, you know, no less than 11% over the past 10 years. This is in US dollar terms, right? For a development finance institution that finances renewable energy, agriculture, farmers, uh, that does uh, transport projects, that does, um, SME lending, um, microfinance. So we, 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 we have a very nice blended footprint of development impact, but we do that in a manner that is commercially sustainable. And, and that is also attractive to, again, uh, institutional investors alongside the sovereigns and the multilaterals that typically are also investors and shareholders of TDB. Yeah, that return uh, definitely runs against the idea that you have to take a significant discount to do development. 
um, because that is a good commercial return and you are doing meaningful things in the economies you're operating in. You had mentioned lacking finance uh, in some of the markets you operate in, and we all know the COVID crisis has also come with some constraints on liquidity in the markets. So how has TDB been navigating and supporting uh, the economies in a return to growth in a hopefully post-COVID world? Well, again, a very pertinent question, Aubrey. Uh, these are very difficult times for the whole world indeed. Uh, Africa is no, no different. In fact, in the case of Africa, it's even more so uh, sensitive because even though our health impact hasn't been as, as extensive as other parts of the world, the economic impact has been quite significant. And because our base is quite low, having a pullback of 700 basis points, seven to eight percent reduction in our growth trajectory, you know, it, it really does uh, have, its, uh, have its cost to our development agenda. Uh, we uh, still have a population growth uh, trajectory that's quite significant. You know, we're around two and a half percent. Some countries are higher than that. And so you really need to have, uh, you know, five to six percent growth just to have that per capita income going. And so, yeah, we, we, we're seeing uh, the continent flatlining this year. And of course, that's because uh, demand has basically uh, shrunk due to lockdowns and semi-lockdowns and the like. Yeah, we global trade stopping, tourism, 10% of Kenyan GDP comes from tourism. So all of those things have a dramatic impact. Um, but, you know, companies still need to, to letters of credit and liquidity can be a challenge during times like this. Well, you know, the first thing we did, Opry, is we said, you know, while the world is going into lockdown, TDB needs to go into overdrive, right? That was our, our motto. And, and we actually lived up to it because we actually formed a whole new series of partnerships between March and, and September this year. And we, we've, we've, we've created new facilities, new windows so that um, SMEs and, and other clients, you know, still have the benefit of getting that access to finance. So uh, clearly in this kind of, you know, crisis, uh, you have a, um, a flight to safety, you have liquidity hoarding that goes on because of course everybody's bracing for all sorts of uh, adverse impacts. What we did is we made sure we kept our doors open. Uh, we didn't pull the carpet from any of our clients. We dispersed various projects on schedule, on milestone, and we continued to open letters of credit and we were importing fertilizer and all sorts of strategic essential commodities that are necessary to keep to keep the lights on, right? In Africa, we 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 have uh, you know a lot of um, strategic commodities that are not uh, sourced from within the continent. So we have a lot of importing that we have to do. Quite a bit of what we also import is intra-Africa trade type commodities. So you know, like the fertilizer, a lot of the fertilizer that we 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 open letters of credit for, they come from within Africa. They're mostly from Morocco. And so we financed the trade between Morocco and Ethiopia, and that's now going to extend to two, three other countries because Morocco is a big fertilizer producer. And so we've uh, made sure we've kept uh, our doors open. We've uh, shored up our liquidity, strengthened our partnerships to ensure that SMEs can get uh, not just working capital, but expansion capital and growth capital for those that are good for it, right? Of course, we are a bank. We have to do our homework and make sure that risk is being uh, properly assessed so it's about choosing who deserves and who doesn't deserve and that's the hard world that we live in but for those that we know are viable and have a deserving case we make sure that we do our part and many have said that there is opportunity in crisis and so you know i've been uh inspired by the digitization acceleration that we're seeing across the continent and maybe some of the structural change that will come to some of the economies that have been you know generally dependent on cash crop exports or raw material exports and some of the reshoring of supply chains in conjunction with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, some of those structural changes will be very good because we know that the economies in the region that are more diversified will likely recover growth faster. So in this picture, what is giving you hope right now and what are the positive trends for growth that you're seeing not only for the region but for TDB Group? Well, I think, I think uh, 
there, there's always, as you say, a silver lining in, in a cloud. And so what's happening is uh, policymakers are really redoubling their efforts to promote diversification. That means, uh, of course, uh, pursuing agro-processing type of projects that helps take the commodities that's you know, the mainstay of Africa, add value to it, and maybe ensure a little bit more self-sufficiency in some critical areas, whether it's food or food-related uh, commodities like fertilizer. So these are the things that we, we see the governments and policymakers uh, creating a better policy environment for this kind of investment to happen. And so we have uh, been uh, very excited to see uh, new, new thinking coming through around how to accelerate that kind of transformational and diversification agenda. And we know that for some of the diversified economies already, uh, this has been a boon in a way, right? So the Kenyas, the Ethiopias, the Rwandas of this world have, um, you know, been a little bit more resilient than the, the mono product, the mono commodity type economies. And I think it's sent a wake up call to many. And so I think, um, this is where you really need an institution like TDB to come in and put, you know, long-term financing facilities in place to help that uh, breakout and that diversification of, of investment to help add value, create more jobs and, and, and create less uh, dependency on, on single commodities. And so in that regard, we, we, we think there'll be a lot of demand. There'll be pent up demand that will start to unlock in 2021. And we are ready because we've been building up a lot of facilities. We have a lot of strategic partners who are giving us long-term money, which we can then use that firepower to help the deserving cases that are seemingly feasible. So, so yes, we, we see a lot of opportunity. And of course, on the technology side, we were the first bank in Africa actually to, to do a live end-to-end -end blockchain based trade finance deal, which was very important when the world locked down around us DHL was taking forever to move, not, not to any fault of theirs, but clearly there was just uh, severe logistical delays going on all around us. And we felt that uh, the time had come to start scaling up on some of these innovations that we had already begun to do in 2019, right? So, so we are now uh, very comfortable in, in doing blockchain-based trade finance deals. If these, this is, of course, as you know, document-heavy, uh, business and banking and there's a lot of movement of paper and documentation originals and all of that you lose weeks just uh, waiting for documents to go back and forth and if you can have a technology enabled solution that uh, provides that kind of capability like blockchain does by having distributed ledger being uh, accessible and interfaceable all at once with multiple parties all across the world it just saves huge amount of time I mean, for a trade finance transaction of 90 days, saving three, four weeks is one third of the, of the lifespan of the entire deal, right? So that's just one thing we've done. The other thing we've done is, of course, we've, we've deepened our partnerships in the African jurisdictions where we don't have offices. So we, we've, we've sort of deepened our relationships with legal firms to do due diligence on our behalf, to do some more of the uh, the scoping and the, the follow-up work that typically we would send our own teams to do bits and pieces of. So we've also started to, to extend our transactional capabilities by working smartly through specialized firms that we know are good for, for some of that work. Well, that's fantastic, Edmasi. I really uh, am inspired by that innovation in and of itself, especially when we've heard that private equity has basically slowed down in the region because they can't figure out how to do due diligence across distance when you can't travel. So I'm glad you're innovating there. And thank you for joining us uh, from Nairobi today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. It was good.